Type, 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 type. Oh, hello there, everybody. Trek Cultures, Adam Cleary here, and with extreme apologies in advance, I've been doing some thinking. Yes, I know, I know this never, this never ever, 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 ever ends well, but I was doing some thinking, right, and I thought that Star Trek might have a prestigious honour amongst all fictional works. I think it has the most expanded and the most adventurous and the most wide-reaching universe ever created. Now, a lot of people will say other shows, they'll put their favourites forward for this particular honour, but I just think Star Trek, given that it's been going since the 60s, has multiple different series, dozens of films, different timelines, so many different shows, so many different characters, so many different things, nothing quite gets that close. Like, we must be getting on for like 800 episodes of television, plus like 12 films, comic books, graphic novels, everything, and it all combines in the same wonderful, rich universe. Now, why is this relevant, Adam? Why are you telling me about this in a video? It seems an incredibly short point to make for what culture. Well, yes, that is, but it also got me thinking this is a universe of possibilities. So, if it's the biggest universe of possibilities, that means it has the biggest, or certainly the most numerable, possibilities. You get me? Anyway, bottom line, it started getting me on the whole what if thing in the Star Trek universe and wondering what the biggest what ifs in Star Trek actually were, and not only what they were, how they would actually play out. So that's that's the premise, such as it is. My name is Adam Cleary, and these are the 10 biggest what ifs in Star Trek history. Number 10, what if Picard was given command of Deep Space Nine? All right, so there are a load of different ways you could measure this, but technically Deep Space Nine was the first, like, proper, proper Star Trek spin-off. Like, yes, I know The Next Generation is technically a spin-off of the original series, but such was the gap between the two and the fact there was no overlapping characters. That was more of a reboot and a revival. Deep Space Nine took a universe that was already ongoing and spun it off. And in the pilot episode, we had Commander Benjamin Sisko meeting Captain Picard, and it does get you thinking, well, you know, Picard is such a strong advocate of the Bajorans joining the Federation, he knows so much about the Cardassians, would he not have been a better pick for this assignment than some guy who's straight out of a shipyard who kind of wants to jack it all in anyway? And the answer to that is, yeah, he would have been. So what would have happened if they'd done that, if there'd been no Cisco and Picard had taken Deep Space Nine? Well, from a televisual standpoint, that would technically have made the next generation the spin-off to Deep Space Nine, because it would have been like the Riker adventures, because Picard was about as close to a central protagonist as that show had. So him going to do his own thing would have made the next generation kind of a B-show. And if they'd done that, you can absolutely bet your ass there would have been loads of crossovers between the two. The crews would have been mingling and merging all the time. There would have been so many joint storylines, kind of like the way Amy was always really obsessed with with Buffy, that kind of thing. It wouldn't have been the two standalone icons we ended up getting. And I'm just going to say it, Deep Space Nine with Picard in charge would have been, from a narrative standpoint, bad. The whole reason it works is because Sisko is such a flawed character, how he is not only the greatest captain in Star Trek history, as I've discussed in a video, but also so fundamentally human. He has to grow and evolve with the changing circumstances. Picard was just the man, you throw him into that situation, it would have been pretty cut and dry and pretty boring as a result. And without getting into the whole thing about Cisco being the emissary to the prophets and thus always being destined to fix Bajor, I would have quite liked to see Picard versus Guldacat as a long-running thing. That would have been nice. Number nine, what if the Deep Space Nine wormhole opened into Borg territory in the Delta Quadrant? Everyone would have died, basically. I will try and add some insight to this one, but there's just not really that much more to it than that. Like, yes, it's an interesting proposition. What if that wormhole had gone to the Delta Quadrant instead of the Gamma Quadrant? And given how much of the Delta Quadrant the Borg encompassed, chances are it would have ended up somewhere in their neck of the woods. And that would have been it. They would have just poured through the wormhole. They would have assimilated Bajor and then jumped onto the entire rest of the Alpha Quadrant. Would have been pretty sure all that. It would have also made Star Trek Voyager a far more simpler, far more shorter TV series because Janeway would have known there was a stable wormhole somewhere in the Delta Quadrant and they just had to find it and then they could nip home after just a couple of years. And don't get me wrong, they did take a massive shortcut thanks to the Borg, but it would have been the whole premise of the series. Ah, we're stuck here. Well, let's go find the big woodly doodly hole. Number eight, what if the Dominion had discovered the wormhole before Starfleet? When we start Deep Space Nine, the Cardies, can I say Cardies? Is that 
Is that racist? Can you be racist about a fictional alien race? Moral maze, all of this. Anyway, when we start Deep Space Nine, the Cardassians are moving all their stuff off of Bajor. They are exiting the planet and Starfleet are moving in. But the thing is, if the Dominion had discovered the wormhole before Starfleet had managed to do it, then they would have poured through at a time when the Cardassians were looking to leave Bajor. And oh look, it's a very easy, occupiable world just sitting on the other side of the woobly doobly tube. And in effect, Bajor would have just traded one set of oppressors for another, and the Federation probably not wanting to start a war with this brand new alien empire over a planet which hasn't even joined them yet, would have just stayed well away. And to be completely honest, given how brutal the Cardassians had been up until this point, I would go out on a limb and say Bajorans would probably welcome the Dominion with open arms because, you know, they're all very about appearances, aren't they? Oh, come join, join the Dominion by, by free will, except I'm just imagining Wei Yoon making the pitch to Kai Opaka over all this. Oh, we will welcome you in to our warm family and some such like that. Anyway, Bajorans would have gone along with that. Easy, easy, easy. The Dominion would have had a nice foothold in the Alpha Quadrant and things would have been terrible. Number seven, what if the rest of the Star Trek franchise had Discovery's spore drive? Now, this one came up on social media a while ago, right? Because the whole premise, the whole problem with the premise, rather, of the first season of Discovery was, wait, so Starfleet have invented a thing that just allows you to appear anywhere in the universe. Would this not have been relevant to mention at some other point in the franchise? Like, it would have made Star Trek Voyager an incredibly boring series, like, ah, oh, we're stranded in the Delta Quadrant. Oh well. Now Discovery did kind of acknowledge that this was a bit of a problem and address it in season two by erasing themselves from the universe and from the timeline and everyone being sworn to secrecy under penalty of torture. But the question still remains, Starfleet did invent the spore drive. So why did they not perfect the spore drive in the hundred years of Federation history we've seen in other shows? And actually, I want to pull up an issue with that. The Pegasus, that fantastic episode of Star Trek The Next Generation where it turns out that Starfleet has successfully invented a cloaking device and while they were testing it, it went wrong and then there was a whole cover up with Riker, etc. etc. Yeah, you remember, you remember that really, really good episode, right? Well, the premise was there. They had invented a cloaking device but then decided they would just never ever use that and in all the time since, Starfleet never perfected the cloaking device no matter how much they fell out with the Romulans or the Klingon Starfleet and the Federation do like to invent things, then decide they're bad, and then just squash them forever. They would have done that with the spore drive. So it's really short, what if that? Like if they just remembered the spore drive or even if they perfected it or if they kept it around, they still would never have used it in the other series because they just decided it was bad, like they've done with countless other game-changing weapons and devices and inventions over the years. They just, I hate to say it, right? But they're kind of a bunch of fannies, aren't they? Number six, what if First Contact was with the Andorians instead of the Vulcans? All right, so First Contact Day, the moment that humanity found out it wasn't alone in the universe, the Vulcans landed, gave it the big hood thing and did that. And nobody was weirded out that aliens looked exactly like us, just had slightly more pointy ears. Anyway, I digress. Now, the only reason the Vulcans were the ones to make First Contact with Earth was because their ship just happened to be passing by and detected the warp signature and were like, aha, those monkeys, they're ready to join the intergalactic kegger party or whatever the hell they call it and so they taught humanity about peace and exploration and forever molded starfleet in their own image i don't care how many episodes of enterprise you watched where it was like oh we're really cool and the vulcans are lame we're gonna we're gonna be our own space-faring military organization dad it was pretty much just like hard vulcans that was starfleet the thing is, the Andorians are shaggers, in my opinion, and they kind of go around doing wars, doing fights, doing all the fun stuff. And if they had discovered humanity first, provided they hadn't just immediately conquered the planet, they would have shaped humanity into this spacefaring, militaristic race. Like, the guys who just come off the back of World War III, you think that couldn't have been harnessed into space aggression? I'm gonna boil this down really easily for you here, right? If the Vulcans hadn't made first contact with humanity, then humanity would have ended up conquering Vulcan. Easy. Number five, what if the disaster that destroyed SETI Alpha 5 didn't happen? Ah, yes, here it is. The reason why Khan is actually the good guy in The Wrath of Khan and not actually the bad guy. He gets marooned on a planet, which is then inhospitable and everybody dies. He was wronged. Now, of course, there's the whole butterfly effect with all of this. If the disaster hadn't happened, then the planet wouldn't have been considered for the Genesis Project, and thus they would never have found Khan, and he never would have got the Reliant, he never would have fought Kirk, and Spock would never have died, and the entire main overall thrust of the original movies would never actually have happened. Wow, that's a mind blower when you think about it. Yeah, like, think about it. If Kirk hadn't marooned Khan on that particular planet, his son wouldn't have been murdered by some Klingons. 
makes you think. But then hang on, like everything that happens in the Undiscovered Country is based in Kirk's hatred for Klingons, which all comes from the fact that they murdered his son because he was on that planet because they had to go get Spock back because he'd been killed fighting the Reliant, which this can't only had because the planet got like, got genuinely the entire history of the Star Trek universe would have been completely different, completely different if Kirk had just picked a different planet. That's insane! And I'm not even gonna get into, by the way, the possibilities of Khan actually setting up a society which worked for years and years and years and generations and generations, which could, of course, then become a Federation member world or could have become its own empire. That's another video entirely. I've just, I've rocked myself with this. Number four, what if Tasha Yar wasn't killed by the skin of evil? Well, it depends on where you want to look at this, doesn't it? Because if Tasha Yar hadn't been killed, then Denise Crosby would have been on Star Trek for much longer, but that's very, space chicken and space egg, isn't it? A couple of small little effects with this one. No people like to imagine what the next generation would have been like if Yara had remained in charge. And I think it's safe to say that eventually the space loneliness would have led to more space <laughs> with her and Data, which would have probably ended up being one of the first fully just normalized human artificial life form relations, which is an interesting case study in itself. But the real issue, of course, is Worf. Now, Wolf goes on to become an incredibly important part in Federation culture. His role between the Federation and the Klingons is hugely significant in the upcoming wars. He ends up being, I don't mind saying it, one of the most pivotal figures in the entire history of the Alpha Quadrant. But all of that starts because there's a job going. Like, Wolf was a bit of a joke, he was a bit of a mess, he was in command, he was kind of just dicking around, he had his big gold thing, he got aggressive all the time and got told to stop talking. It was only when he became Chief of Security of the Enterprise that he kind of just, like, knuckled down and became a really serious officer, and that just wouldn't have happened if Tasha Yar was still there. It's kind of crazy. I mean, can we sit here and say right now that the Federation would definitely have won the Dominion War had it not been for Worf? I don't think we can rule that out. So if Tasha Yar hadn't died on that planet, you might all be speaking Jem'Hadar right now. Number three, what if Shinzon did kill Picard in Star Trek Nemesis? Always like thinking about this one, not because I don't love Picard or Patrick Stewart or even Star Trek Picard, just because I quite like the idea that the end of that film is switched around, right? Let's just assume for a second that Shin's on the plan doesn't work, he doesn't get Picard's DNA. The ending of Nemesis is exactly the same, except it's Picard who puts the transporter thing on data and then blows the ship up. What would have happened is the Enterprise would have continued on under Captain Riker with data as his first in command, and then decades later, Star Trek data would have been greenlit by CBS, and I would have binge watched that harder and more enthusiastically than there is no punchline to that which isn't sex based. Sorry. Number two, what if Q appeared to Captain Kirk and led him to the Borg? Again, everyone would be dead. Now granted, this wasn't really possible, I don't think, because Q's whole thing with Picard was you are pushing too hard and too fast and you are not ready for what is out there, whereas the five-year mission the Enterprise was on was kind of a little bit more modest in its aim, so maybe it wouldn't quite have got his heckles up quite like that. But had it, had it, that would have been interesting. <laughs> I mean, for a start, let's call a spade a spade here, friends. Q would have 1,000% appeared to Captain Kirk as a woman. Like, he liked making John Luke his little plaything because, well, he knew that John Luke's favourite thing to do was to debate and to conquer and to, like, mentally outmaneuver his opponent. So he always appeared to Picard as somebody who was on his level cerebrally and used to, like, go back and forth with him. Kirk's version of that was he liked to... But let's say all that did play out exactly the same way. Let's say Q through the Enterprise, the original Enterprise, into that part of space to meet the Borg, whatever version of the Borg they were back then. Now, hear me out here. Picard going back to the Federation and telling everybody that, you know, there's things out there that we're not ready for. We need to prepare, we need to evolve as a culture, we need to rethink our exploration ideals. That is one thing. Kirk going back to Federation HQ and going, there are some really scary metal aliens out there. Starfleet would have just been literally the exact military version of themselves you saw in that Abrams film. Big ships, bigger guns, lots of angry men in command. Basically, if that had happened in the original series, then both The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager would have had lots, 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 lots more killing, I think. Yeah. Number one, what if Riker was taken by the Borg instead of Picard? Now, I didn't actually know this until very recently, but Patrick Stewart's contract was up heading in to the filming of the best of both worlds. The reason they did the Lacutus of Borg storyline was because there was the potential they might have to write him out. 
Thankfully, that didn't happen, of course, and either Patrick Stewart or his agent or his mom, I've not an actor, I don't know how these things work, decided it was better for him to stay on the show, and he just came back unassimilated, but with an incredible narrative arc to play out across the rest of the series and even the movies. Now, there are two schools of thought on this one, in my head at least, and one is that everything would have just played out the exact same way it had if Riker had been taken instead. The writers of the shows and the movies would have done the exact same thing they did with Picard, except now it's Riker who's got this terrible unresolved trauma, who is always haunted by his memories of the Borg, who stays on the ship in first contact and goes mano a mano, mano a woman, oh, mano a roboto thing with the Borg Queen. That's number one. Number two, and it's the one I actually like, is that Picard, not being such a goddamn sap, wouldn't have bothered trying to rescue him. And if they hadn't bothered trying to rescue him, he's gone. We must, uh, we cannot put, put the life of one man in front of the, the lives of the entire Federation or something like that and just gone and tried to kill him. That wouldn't have worked. The only reason they stopped that Borg cube over Earth was because Picard, in his Borg mode, managed to make them all go to sleep. So if he hadn't done that, then Earth would have been assimilated. And that's the end of the Star Trek franchise. After, like, three seasons of The Next Generation. Which is grim. And then, of course, there's the other issue where if the Borg Queen is looking to seduce somebody on the Enterprise to further her evil assimilation goals, you wouldn't go, wouldn't go for Data, would you, if there was still loads of bits of Borg in Riker? Riker would put his bits... That's the joke! You get the joke, Jamaharon! So they have those are 10 Star Trek what ifs thought by an idiot and spoken aloud to you without any real consideration whatsoever. I have a headache. Let me know what you made of it all in the comments below. Of course, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. This place, none of your business. In the meantime though, thanks so much for watching. I have of course been Adam Cleary and I'll see you soon. Mwah.